Hey guys, I'm John and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. In our previous video, we talked about dark energy, so in this one we're gonna talk about dark matter. Now, there wasn't all that much to say about dark energy since we know very little about it, but dark matter is a whole other beast. Even though we don't know that much about it either, we still know a lot more about it than dark energy, and we have many things going on at the moment throughout the world to discover what it really is. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons, and let's get started. So what is dark matter exactly? Well, it's something that we can't detect except by the fact that it has to be there to exert gravity to form the large-scale structures of the universe. When we look at just ordinary matter, it can't create enough gravity to hold entire galaxies together, for example. The name dark matter is not really accurate either because it implies that it's matter. Neil deGrasse Tyson would prefer the label dark gravity because it's really the only thing we know about it. It exerts gravity and it doesn't emit light. Therefore, dark gravity matches much better. The main experiments that are going on at the moment are mostly assuming that it will be a form of matter, but we don't really know yet. There are other experiments though that don't make this assumption and try to find other solutions. We also know that dark matter doesn't interact with normal matter, other than through its gravitational effects. It also doesn't emit any light, so it's incredibly difficult to detect. On top of this, we also know that it doesn't interact with itself either, or it would clump up in the same way as ordinary matter does, and form dark matter planets and galaxies, but it's actually all spread out. So let's talk a bit about the behavior of dark matter now. We already talked about how it doesn't interact with normal, with ordinary matter, other than through its gravitational effects, but that doesn't mean it never interacts at all. It might just be so infrequent and unlikely that it would behave a bit like neutrinos, perhaps interact with matter even less than neutrinos do. For those who don't know yet, we have about 65 billion neutrinos passing through every square centimeter of surface every single second on Earth. So there were probably about 200 billion neutrinos passing through just the tip of your index finger as I said that previous sentence. They're just so small and atoms are so much empty space that they're almost never colliding. Dark matter could behave in approximately the same way or perhaps even more infrequent. Other than that, we also know that dark matter doesn't interact with radiation at all. So it doesn't absorb or emit any light of any wavelength of any kind. So the only thing that dark matter can do is bend space due to its gravity and change the path of light in the same way as ordinary matter does. A good example of this is a solar eclipse where the moon's gravity bends the sun rays just slightly. So let's talk about the evidence that we have that shows that dark matter exists and that it's not something we just made up. The first piece of evidence is the uh, speed of galaxy rotations. Based on all our calculations, the speed of rotation of galaxies is simply too fast for visible mass. That's if we add up dust, gas clouds, planets, stars, black holes, etc. You name it, we've counted it. If, there, if all there was was the mass of the matter that's visible, galaxies would be flinging off matter like a quickly rotating wet ball flings off water. In other words, all galaxies would be falling apart right now, and that's if they would have been able to form in the first place. The second piece of evidence is the way orbits work in galaxies. We know by Kepler's third law of planetary motion that in a solar system, the further the planet is from its star, the slower it orbits. With galaxies, that's not the case at all. Contrary to solar systems, the further out you are from the center of a galaxy, the faster your velocity is, or at worst, it's equal. It, this is weird because there's not enough mass from visible matter to do that. Something needs to be there that has to be five to six times the mass of the visible matter. The third piece of evidence is from studying galaxy clusters, and a cluster implies that galaxies are bound gravitationally together. If there was only the mass of visible matter, galaxies would be flung off from the cluster. There simply isn't enough mass uh, that's visible to cause enough gravity to hold clusters together. 
One of the methods of calculating the mass of a cluster is by the X-rays that are emitted by the hot gas in clusters. These X-rays allow us to uh, estimate the temperature and density which gives us the pressure, and since pressure and gravity balance out, it gives us the cluster's mass profile. Another method is gravitational lensing, which bends the light due to the gravity it creates. So this gravity bends the light and it allows us to estimate the mass of the cluster without needing to observe the dynamics, like velocity. The fourth piece of evidence for the existence of dark matter is the gravitational lensing that we just mentioned. For galaxy clusters, we used it to uh, estimate the mass uh, using the gravity it creates. For dark matter, it's very similar. When a massive object like a cluster of galaxies passes between us and the quasar, it disturbs the light's path from the quasar to us. For those who don't know, quasars are extremely luminous objects that can be thousands of times brighter than entire galaxies. So when a cluster of galaxies passes between us and a quasar, it basically acts like a lens that bends the light's path because of its gravity. The more the light bends, the more massive the object is that's passing between us and the quasar. Once we know the mass of that cluster by how much it bends light, we can then compare to all the visible matter and we can always only account for about one-fifth of the total. This means that there needs to be something else that's massive and that we can't see, and there needs to be about five to six times more of it than visible matter. We call it dark matter. The fifth piece of evidence is the cosmic microwave background. This is uh, considered the best source of evidence for dark matter. It's essentially a snapshot of the entire universe at about 380,000 years old. This map gives us all the temperature data with peaks in a graph that we call the power spectrum. This graph is determined by the oscillations of the hot gas in the early universe. The resonant frequencies and amplitudes of these oscillations are determined by the composition of the universe. The peaks themselves allow us to calculate the geometry of the universe and the energy distribution. The first peak in the graph represents the geometry of the universe. This was first theorized to be found at one degree because of a predicted flat geometry to the universe, and was indeed the case, so another point for discoveries through calculations before observations. And by the way, the universe having a flat geometry doesn't mean in any way that the Earth is flat. The second peak allows us to get the ratio of ordinary matter which puts it at 5% and matching all the peaks gives us the ratio of dark matter in the universe at 27%. Here's another example of what happens to the graph when we change the amount of dark matter. Getting this graph to match the actual power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background gives us the expected 27% ratio uh, of dark matter. This is considered irrefutable evidence for the existence of dark matter. With all this information, we were also able to make models and simulations of the early universe, and it's only when we integrate dark matter into the simulation that it's essentially a perfect match with what we can observe today. The sixth piece of evidence are the large-scale structure formations. Shortly after the Big Bang, the universe's matter was pretty evenly distributed in the universe. There were just some very tiny differences here and there. Even in the cosmic microwave background, when the universe was only 380,000 years old, it, it, it only had some very, very tiny fluctuations. These small differences condensed into stars, galaxies, and even larger structures that we see today. Since ordinary matter is affected by radiation, and radiation was the dominant element in the universe really early on, it would have interfered with the formation of these large-scale structures. The universe simply is not old enough to allow uh, the large-scale structures to form if all there was was visible matter. Since dark matter is not affected by radiation, it provides a solution to this otherwise insurmountable problem. The seventh piece of evidence uh, is our studies of galaxy cluster collisions, especially the one that we call uh, the bullet cluster. When galaxies collide, there are almost no collisions, it's as if two ghosts are passing through each other. With clusters, it's different because of the gas within them. When clusters collide, the gas also collides, it gets really hot and emits x-rays. 
With the bullet cluster, we map the concentration of mass from the distortions we could observe, and it doesn't match visible matter at all. In this picture, which is a bit of a map for the concentration of mass, uh, the purple areas are where mass is concentrated, but we can't see any of it. The pink areas are the visible clouds of gas that emit X-rays. So most of the actual mass is towards the outside edges and emits no light at all of any wavelength, again shown in purple here. Others have also uh, been mapped and everything shows similar results. The simplest explanation to all this is once again that dark matter exists. The eighth and final piece of evidence I'll mention in this video is our studies of type 1a supernovae. Those are what we call standard candles, which always have the same luminosity. With this luminosity being constant, we can calculate the, their distance by how much we see them dimmed. Using them, we can also calculate how fast the universe expanded in the past, which we attribute to dark energy. All these calculations yield the same approximate results, which is that the universe is made up of 68% dark energy and 5% ordinary matter, which leaves 27% that we labeled as dark matter. There's even more evidence that all support dark matter and the estimated amount of it. I'll just move on for now so we can keep this video moving. With uh, all this evidence, we know that there's something out there and we know that we can't see it. We know it interacts uh, only through gravity, and we know that there's five to six times more of it than visible matter. So it's everywhere. The simplest explanation to all of this is dark matter. So now let's talk about what we tried to explain dark matter with but was falsified. The first was a, a hypothesis that dark matter could be black holes. This was falsified because black holes make supernovae brighter when they pass between us and the supernova because uh, of how incredibly much it bends the light. The brighter the supernova becomes, the more massive the black hole is. We looked at two decades worth of supernova observations and concluded that black holes could only account for about 40% of the mass that we attribute to dark matter. The second was a hypothesis that dark matter could be antimatter. This was falsified because antimatter that meets uh, matter annihilate each other and give off powerful gamma rays, but no such gamma rays can be detected. We also hypothesize that it could be gas, but none of the expected radio waves can be detected. We tried to hypothesize that it could be dust or dead stars or even rogue planets, but those would all be visible when they're backlit by stars or other luminous objects. Essentially, we hypothesized everything we could possibly think of with ordinary matter, and absolutely everything was falsified. There's only a small fraction of what we know as dark matter that could be from other sources of ordinary matter, but it can never account for all of it. So let's get into the hypotheses that we have today as to what dark matter could be. The first is what we call weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs for short. Those would be particles with mass that interact with matter with around the same force as the electroweak force. This is a unified description of two of the fundamental forces, the <clears throat> electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force. It has a very short range, but it's stronger than gravity at those ranges. The second hypothesis is axions. Axions are particles about a billion times lighter than an electron and much lighter than a wimp. Axions would work a bit like neutrinos that barely ever interact with normal matter, but axions themselves are matter. This matches well and it could also help explain another mystery of how quarks are able to bind together uh, with the strong nuclear force to form the nucleus of atoms. Another is that dark matter could be a weird fluid that moves towards you if you try to push it away. Models and simulations were made of this and found that it could potentially also explain why the universe is expanding. Right now, the universe's expansion is all credited to dark energy that we know even less about for the time being. This fluid hypothesis is purely speculative at this point though, so it's just an effort to attack the problem from a different angle since everything else is having trouble finding the solution or coming up short. 
Other hypotheses have also been made. WIMPs and axions have been talked about since the 1980s to try and explain dark matter. We're at a time right now where many scientists are trying to explain it in different ways from all sorts of different angles. Some of these more exotic approaches include gravitational waves, using electrons to hope for an interaction, theorizing a periodic table of dark matter like we have currently for elements, and using machine learning to find very tiny fluctuations in otherwise very noisy data. A lot of experiments are currently underway throughout the entire world to find dark matter. There are three main approaches to the problem make it, break it, or shake it. The make it approach tries to produce dark matter with particle accelerators and collisions like they do at the Large Hadron Collider. The break it approach, which is also called the indirect detection, tries to detect dark matter annihilation or, de or decay. The shake it method, which is also called the direct detection, tries to detect it with incredibly sensitive detectors, a bit like how we detect neutrinos from the, from the sun in the Super K observatory. For WIMPs, there are experiments happening all over the world using all th three methods of detection. Uh, for axions, there's the Axion Dark Matter Experiment collaboration that announced that they'd finally tweaked their detectors to be sensitive enough to detect axions. It works with a super powerful magnet that converts incoming axions into radio waves that the detector can then pick up. It's a bit like tuning a radio, though, it's, uh, where we turn the knob very slowly and we hope that eventually we hear something really clearly rather than just noise. Those two are probably the front runners, but there are tons more also underway using different methods. Some even try to find interactions with electrons, even if we mainly always said that dark matter doesn't interact with ordinary matter. So the problem is being approached from many different angles with many different types of experiments right now. Even the less likely ones are being pursued. So how could knowledge about dark matter help us anyway? Well, one possibility is that it could be used as a source of energy, but there's really no limits to what it could become. When we first discovered the electron, we couldn't have imagined that it would become our first TVs with cathode, uh, cathode ray tubes, otherwise known as the familiar CRT for short. Now, this knowledge is everywhere in our technology today. Just your smartphone is packed full of devices that rely on our knowledge of electrons. So when do we expect to find the answer to what dark matter is? Well, if the discovery is to be made by one of the experiments already underway, it could be just a couple of years. Otherwise, it could take much longer since we'll have to come up with new experiments, fund them, build them, run them, and analyze their results all over again. I think it's reasonable and fair at this point to take an optimistic approach though and say that we could have the answer within the next 10 years. So I'm curious what's the science discovery that you're most looking forward to? Let me know in the comments. If you'd like to learn more interesting science stuff, make sure to like, subscribe and click the bell notification. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can visit my Patreon page for more information. For everything else, you can go to respectyourintellect.com and everything will be available there. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.